What's up everybody? China Cycling here today with a look at this. The XOSS Sprint GPS Head Unit. On paper, it's great. A lovely 2.7 inch display, signals from four different GPS services, dual Bluetooth and ANT Plus connectivity, map navigation and up to 37 hours battery life in a pretty good looking exterior design that resembles a Wahoo device, all in a package that retails for 169 US dollars. But does it live up to that impressive spec list? Let's have a look. The Sprint is the first head unit from Xinjia, the company that has a Strava-like app that boasts millions of users in China. They started with the app and have been getting into hardware. I've done a video on their 2-in-1 speed cadence sensor before and I loved that. But the Sprint head unit, how does it compare? First of all, there's actually two versions of this head unit, a native Chinese version and the international version. I have the international version here. It has slightly better specs than the Chinese version. The international version was actually launched via Kickstarter back at the end of 2017. They raised 204,000 US dollars from more than a thousand backers meeting their target on Kickstarter. A bit of Googling shows a Forbes article that is an interview with their founder, uh, Jiang Mingqing, talking about wanting to enter the Western market. He seems to have a genuine passion for cycling, and he did his master's degree in the UK, so should have a good understanding of what international consumers want from a head unit. So far, so good. First impressions of the unit are great. The presentation of the box is really well done, and despite its low price, you get the impression of a real quality product. You twist the unit to release it from its included mount. Uh, the twist mount is very similar to the Garmin mount, in such that I had no problems mounting the sprint on my Garmin mounts, and vice versa. Initial setup is pretty straightforward, but then we run into the first problem with the sprint its connection speed. The head unit relies heavily on being connected to the smartphone companion app, similar to the Wahoo head units. There's no major problems with the app. You can either use the Chinese app or the international app to connect and update the unit. But the data connection between the head unit and the smartphone is agonizingly slow. Firmware updates take a long time and even syncing rides can be frustratingly slow. Files from rides of a few hours that are around the 100 KB mark can take the better part of a minute to upload. Annoying, but not a deal breaker. Another annoying first day experience was plugging it into charge. The plasticky rubber cover for the charging port snapped right off in my hand. Looking online, this seems to be a common issue. I can still use the cover to keep water out, but whenever I remove the tiny cover for charging, I now have to be very careful where I put it so it doesn't get lost. Moving on to setting up the head unit. The menus on the device are fairly intuitive, but most setting up is better handled by the companion app. Try to adjust some settings on the device and you'll just get a message telling you to set it up on the phone. I personally often like to change data fields mid-ride. On my Garmin, if I'm riding and I find the sun suddenly coming down quicker than expected, I love that I can just lung press a field and quickly change it to time until sunset or whatever. The Sprint offers 40 different data fields, but changing a data field on the unit requires taking out your phone, connecting to the device, and changing the setting in the app. And that leads us to another problem. Once you start a ride, there's no way to enter the settings. Not even by pausing the device. You must end your ride before you can enter the settings on the device, or before you can connect to the mobile app to change the settings there. 
pretty much the only thing you can do without ending the ride is calibrate your power meter. That brings us nicely onto connectivity. The device has both ANT Plus and Bluetooth 4.0 and actually has really good support for sensors, etc. It can even connect to SRAM's eTab and tell you what gear you're in. I tried it, it works perfectly, although it's a bit of a waste of two data fields. It's good to have the option though. Connecting to my Garmin Vector 2S power meter was also a breeze and calibrating can be done by lung pressing the up button on the side without going into the menus. Speaking of buttons, there's a real lack of them. Just three. The unit was apparently designed to keep the user interface as simple as possible, but it suffers as a consequence. Having only three buttons, there's a huge omission. Laps. That's right. There's no lap function on this head unit. Despite being able to display pretty complicated training metrics such as TSS, training stress score, or NP, normalized power, there's no way to do lap functions. The unit can only display your average power or normalized power for the entire ride. This makes training with the device almost impossible. If today's training plan requires 5 intervals of 1 minute at 120% of FTP, well, good luck keeping track of it. In my opinion, they lost some key functionality in the pursuit of simplicity. If you never use the lap function on your head unit, this may not be a big issue to you. Hold the phone! Hold the phone! I was almost done with this video and a new firmware update came out. The release notes only mentioned bug fixes, but I had to play around and saw laps! You can now lung press the down button to start a new lap. But I don't think it's fully integrated yet because there are no fields. Like there's no data fields such as lap power or lap distance. But it's great to see they've been listening to feedback and continuing to develop the sprint. I sent a message to their VP and he told me that indeed the feature is coming very soon. When you look at the spec sheet, the one number that jumps out you is the battery life. 37 hours of GPS use. That's more than double what other units offer. But is it achievable? Well, first we have to talk about another quirk of the sprint. You can't turn it off. That's right, there's no off switch. Again, maybe it was a decision taken in the hunt of simplicity. If you leave the unit alone for a while, the Kindle-like e-ink screen will just go into a standby mode where it's showing just the time and the unit is supposed to go to sleep. And then the claimed standby life is 90 days, but my sprint seemed to get less than a few weeks on standby. Throughout my time using the sprint, sometimes I'd leave it with a full charge or having just used it for one ride and then come back a week or two later to find the unit dead and in need of a charge. For whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to be shutting down fully, and the standby performance isn't what it should be. Power's just getting drained slowly while it's supposed to be in standby. Again, this is really frustrating if you want to go for a ride. You go to get your head unit, and you realize it's out of juice. Please just give me an option to turn it off, like totally off, asleep, not asleep, just off. This problem rears its head in other ways too. I personally like to put all my days commuting into one ride. So with my Garmin, I ride to my office in the morning, I hit pause, and then I turn the unit off. At lunchtime, I turn the unit back on, and I carry on where I left off. And I do this f throughout the day. However, with the sprint, you pause the unit, and it just sits there. It won't even go to sleep, and you can't turn it off. It just sits there searching for a satellite signal from one of the many GPS providers it uses, trying to connect to everything throughout the Bluetooth and ANT Plus range, and just draining the battery. Commuting like this, just a total of 10 or so kilometers, but with big pauses in between, were really draining the battery. How much was it draining the battery? Well, I can't exactly tell you. The battery indicator is just the style of one bar, two bars, three bars, or full. There's no option to display an actual percentage. 
Either way, sometimes a day of my commuting would take out half the battery due to the unit just constantly searching for signals when it's paused. Sure, I could split my commute into four separate rides, end each ride and let the unit sleep between the rides, but I don't want to clutter my friend's Strava feeds with these small, small commutes. Just give me an option to turn the unit off when paused. GPS is extremely accurate. The device supports four different GPS services. There's the American GPS, the Russian GLONASS, China's own Beidou, and the European Galileo. I'm not actually sure all those services are fully running, but the device supports them. However, you're never really sure which of them you're connected to. There's just a simple GPS signal display, which is either no dots, one dot, two dot, or three dots. And you have no idea which of the services it's connected to. Again, probably a decision for simplicity, but as a techie user or someone who's trying to troubleshoot, it can be a bit frustrating. Another feature of the unit is the maps and navigation. They have worldwide maps available. I only have experience with the Chinese maps, which were detailed and accurate. The navigation is a little finicky, but not bad. First, you have to open the app on the phone and plot a route on there. You can set a start point, the end point, and any waypoints in the middle, and the phone will plot a route. Then you have to save this route to the cloud, connect your Sprint to your phone, go into navigation on the phone, and push the route to your Sprint. Next, in the Sprint menu, you have to choose navigation. Again, you can't choose this if you've already started a ride because the menu isn't available mid-ride, but you can try to guess in the menu which route is the right one. If it's the latest route, it will be the one with the highest number. If it's a route you made before, well, good luck remembering the arbitrary number it got given when you uploaded it. It would be really nice to add useful names here, but no such luck. Now, when you start your ride, switching to the map screen, you'll have an overlay of the route that you should follow. This is actually really nice. There's a countdown to the next turn, and it beeps before you get to the turn, etc. But it's not very smart, it's just a line to follow on the map. If you deviate from the route, it won't give you an updated route, nor will it give you any directions to get you back on the route. So you just have to look at the map and try to get back to the route you should be following. One issue I had when riding in China's far west Xinjiang province, there was a huge road diversion, and I traveled so far from the original route even zooming out the map all the way, I can no longer see the route on the map. Now this is mainly because the map doesn't actually zoom out very far, but I just had to have faith that I was kind of going in the right direction. Eventually the diversion rejoined the original road and I could carry following the route. So another good feature that needs a bit more work. Other quirks of the maps is that they don't rotate to the direction you're traveling. The map is always orientated with the north at the top of the screen. This means if you're heading east or west, you can't actually see a lot of the road in front of you, but you can see a lot of what's to your north. Also, map routes don't unload when you finish the route. So even if you finish the ride, you get to your destination, you finish the ride on the unit, you upload it, the next day you want to head home. So you turn the unit on, no, no, wait, you don't turn it on because it's never off. You wake the unit up and then you start your ride. And your route is still there trying to navigate you back to where you've just left. Because that was your last destination. You realize this and you want to turn off the navigation or change the route to go back home but you can't, because you've already started a ride, which means you can't access the menus, blah de blah de blah It's just the little things like this that make using the Sprint a lot more frustrating than it should be. Now, it sounds like I'm hating on the Sprint pretty hard, but it's more because of what it could be rather than what it isn't. It's so close to being great that the small, obvious letdowns are made all the more frustrating. The screen is beautiful and crisp, the 1000 mAh battery is great, the unit feels a lot more responsive than my Garmin, it's snappier going through the menus and zooming in and out on maps. 
searching and reading about the sprint online is also pretty depressing. Forums and comments are full of people complaining about the unit. Now, maybe there are lots of users out there perfectly happily using their sprints and they never go online to talk about it. So you don't see any good things. Perhaps it's only the minority with problems that feel the need to go online and post about them. I can only speak from my own personal experience. After using the sprint for a while, I compiled a list of all the issues I'd personally had and sent it to XOSS. They got in touch with me super fast and we had some back and forth on what needs to be done to make the unit great. Most of those issues they've been addressing with firmware updates such as the lap function I talked about earlier. This is one positive of these Chinese startup companies. They're willing to listen to their users and their customers. I struggle to imagine industry leaders like Garmin even taking the time to reply to an email that had some criticism of one of their products, no matter how constructive the criticism was. For now though, I don't think the Sprint is ready to replace my Garmin as my everyday bike computer. But I think it's getting close. The bike GPS computer market is heating up. Gone are the days when Garmin dominated everything. As well as Wahoo entering the market, you have Chinese firms such as XOSS, Brighton, iGPS Sport offering new cheaper alternatives. When you stop and consider the hardware that is inside your average GPS head unit and compare it to the most budget of smartphones, it's hard to justify why the GPS bike computer costs more for a lot less hardware. More choice can only be good for the consumer, and that's a good thing. In a recent development, XOSS has partnered with Explover to bring a custom version of the Explover X5 Evo to China with Xingzhe software pre-installed on the unit. The Explover X5 Evo, for those that don't know, is a pretty beasty head unit with a 720p video camera built in. And it will be interesting to see how this affects the future development of the Sprint. If you have any questions about the Sprint, let me know in the comments down below. If you're interested in seeing other Chinese head unit reviews, subscribe to the channel and I'll see what else I can find to review. China Cycling, out.